Proceed, please. Thank you, Senator Grassley. I think after I read my opening statement, I anticipate needing some caffeine, if that is available. Okay. Can you pull the microphone just a little bit closer to you, please? Okay. Uh, uh, can the whole box go a little bit closer? I'm trying, Senator. No. Okay. Well, then... then I'll lean forward. Thank you. I could... I could. Thank you. Okay. Is this good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Grassley and Rank Ranking Member Feinstein, members of the committee. My name is Christine Blasey Ford. I am a professor of psychology at Palo Alto University and a research psychologist at the Stanford University School of Medicine. I won't detail my educational background since it has already been summarized. I have been married to Russell Ford since 2002 and we have two children. I am here today not because I want to be. I am terrified. I am here because I believe it is my civic duty to tell you what happened to me while Brett Kavanaugh and I were in high school. I have described the events publicly before. I summarized them in my letter to Ranking Member Feinstein and again in a letter to Chairman Grassley. I understand and appreciate the importance of your hearing from me directly about what happened to me and the impact that it has had on my life and on my family. I grew up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. I attended the Holton Arms School in Bethesda, Maryland from 1978 to 1984. Holton Arms is an all-girls school that opened in 1901. During my time at the school, Girls at Holton Arms frequently met and became friendly with boys from all boys schools in the area, including the Landon School, Georgetown Prep, Gonzaga High School, as well as our country clubs and other places where kids and families socialized. This is how I met Brett Kavanaugh, the boy who sexually assaulted me. During my freshman and sophomore school years, when I was 14 and 15 years old, my group of friends intersected with Brett and his friends for a short period of time. I had been friendly with a classmate of Brett's for a short time during my freshman and sophomore year. And it was through that connection that I attended a number of parties that Brett also attended. We did not know each other well, but I knew him and he knew me. In the summer of 1982, like most summers, I spent most every day at the Columbia Country Club in Chevy Chase, Maryland, swimming and practicing diving. One evening that summer, after a day of diving at the club, I attended a small gathering at a house in the Bethesda area. There were four boys I remember specifically being at the house. Brett Kavanaugh, Mark Judge, a boy named PJ, and one other boy whose name I cannot recall. I also remember my friend Leland attending. I do not remember all of the details of how that gathering came together, but like many that summer, it was almost surely a spur of the moment gathering. I truly wish I could be more helpful with more detailed answers to all of the questions that have and will be asked about how I got to the party and where it took place and so forth. I don't have all the answers, and I don't remember as much as I would like to. But the details that, about that night that bring me here today are the ones I will never forget. They have been seared into my memory and have haunted me episodically as an adult. When I got to the small gathering, people were drinking beer in a small living room, family room type area on the first floor of the house. I drank one beer. Brett and Mark were visibly drunk. Early in the evening, I went up a very narrow set of stairs leading from the living room to a second floor to use the restroom. When I got to the top of the stairs, I was pushed from behind into a bedroom across from the bathroom. I couldn't see who pushed me. Brett and Mark came into the bedroom and locked the door behind them. There was music playing in the bedroom. 
It was turned up louder by either Brett or Mark once we were in the room. I was pushed onto the bed and Brett got on top of me. He began running his hands over my body and grinding into me. I yelled, hoping that someone downstairs might hear me, and I tried to get away from him, but his weight was heavy. Brett groped me and tried to take off my clothes. He had a hard time because he was very inebriated and because I was wearing a one-piece bathing suit underneath my clothing. I believed he was going to rape me. I tried to yell for help. When I did, Brett put his hand over my mouth to stop me from yelling. This is what terrified me the most and has had the most lasting impact on my life. It was hard for me to breathe and I thought that Brett was accidentally going to kill me. Both Brett and Mark were drunkenly laughing during the attack. They seemed to be having a very good time. Mark seemed ambivalent, at times urging Brett on, and at times telling him to stop. A couple of times I made eye contact with Mark and thought he might try to help me, but he did not. During this assault, Mark came over and jumped on the bed twice while Brett was on top of me. And the last time that he did this, we toppled over and Brett was no longer on top of me. I was able to get up and run out of the room. Directly across from the bedroom was a small bathroom. I ran inside the bathroom and locked the door. I waited until I heard Brett and Mark leave the bedroom, laughing and loudly walk down the narrow stairway, pinballing off the walls on the way down. I waited, and when I did not hear them come back up the stairs, I left the bathroom, went down the same stairwell, through the living room, and left the house. I remember being on the street and feeling an enormous sense of relief that I had escaped that house and that Brett and Mark were not coming outside after me. Brett's assault on me dr drastically altered my life. For a very long time, I was too afraid and ashamed to tell anyone these details. I did not want to tell my parents that I, at age 15, was in a house without any parents present, drinking beer with boys. I convinced myself that because Brett did not rape me, I should just move on and just pretend that it didn't happen. Over the years, I told very, very few friends that I had this traumatic experience. I told my husband before we were married that I had experienced a sexual assault. I had never told the details to anyone, the specific details, until May 2012 during a couple's counseling session. The reason this came up in counseling is that my husband and I had completed a very extensive very long remodel of our home, and I insisted on a second front door, an idea that he and others disagreed with and could not understand. In explaining why I wanted a second front door, I began to describe the assault in detail. I recall saying that the boy who assaulted me could someday be on the US Supreme Court and spoke a bit about his background at an elitist all boys school in Bethesda, Maryland. My husband recalls that I named my attacker as Brett Kavanaugh. After that May 2012 therapy session, I did my best to ignore the memories of the assault because recounting them caused me to relive the experience and caused panic and anxiety. Occasionally, I would discuss the assault in an individual therapy session, but talking about it caused more reliving of the trauma, so I tried not to think about it or discuss it. But over the years, I went through periods where I thought about the attack. I had confided in some close friends that I had had an experience with sexual assault. Occasionally, I stated that my assailant was a prominent lawyer or judge, but I did not use his name. I do not recall each person I spoke to about Brett's assault. 
and some friends have reminded me of these conversations since the publication of the Washington Post story on September 16th, 2018. But until July 2018, I had never named Mr. Kavanaugh as my attacker outside of therapy. This changed in early July 2018. I saw press reports stating that Brett Kavanaugh was on the short list of a list of very well qualified Supreme Court nominees. I thought it was my civic duty to relay the information I had about Mr. Kavanaugh's conduct so that those considering his nomination would know about this assault. On July 6th, I had a sense of urgency to relay the information to the Senate and the President as soon as possible before a nominee was selected. I did not know how specifically to do this. I called my congressional representative and let her receptionist know that someone on the president's shortlist had attacked me. I also sent a message to the encrypted Washington Post confidential tip line. I did not use my name, but I provided the names of Brett Kavanaugh and Mark Judge. I stated that Mr. Kavanaugh had assaulted me in the 1980s in Maryland. This was an extremely hard thing for me to do, but I felt that I couldn't not do it. Over the next two days, I told a couple of close friends on the beach in Aptos, California, that Mr. Kavanaugh had sexually assaulted me. I was very conflicted as to whether to speak out. On July 9th, I received a return phone call from the office of Congresswoman Anna Eshoo after Mr. Kavanaugh had become the nominee. I met with her staff on July 18th and with her on July 20th, describing the assault and discussing my fears about coming forward. Later, we discussed the possibility of sending a letter to Ranking Member Feinstein, who is one of my state senators, describing what occurred. My understanding is that Representative Eshoo's office delivered a copy of my letter to Senator Feinstein's office on July 30th. The letter included my name, but also a request that it be kept confidential. My hope was that providing the information confidentially would be sufficient to allow the Senate to consider Mr. Kavanaugh's serious misconduct without having to make myself, my family, or anyone's family vulnerable to the personal attacks and invasions of privacy that we have faced since my name became public. In a letter dated August 31st, Senator Feinstein wrote that she would not share the letter without my explicit consent, and I appreciated this commitment. Sexual assault victims should be able to decide for themselves when and whether their private experience is made public. As the hearing date got closer, I struggled with a terrible choice. Do I share the facts with the Senate and put myself and my family in the public spotlight? Or do I preserve our privacy and allow the Senate to make its decision without knowing the full truth of his past behaviors? I agonized daily with this decision throughout August and September 2018. The sense of duty that originally motiva motivated me to reach out confidentially to the Washington Post and to Anna Eshoo's office when there was still a list of extremely qualified candidates and to Senator Feinstein was always there, but my fears of the consequences of speaking out started to exponentially increase. During August 2018, the press reported that Mr. Kavanaugh's confirmation was virtually certain. Persons painted him as a champion of women's rights and empowerment. And I believed that if I came forward, my single voice would be drowned out by a chorus of powerful supporters. By the time of the confirmation hearings, I had resigned myself to remaining quiet and letting the committee and the Senate make their decision without knowing what Mr. Kavanaugh had done to me. Once the press started reporting on the existence of the letter I had sent to Senator Feinstein, I faced mounting pressure. Reporters appeared at my home 
and at my workplace, demanding information about the letter in the presence of my graduate students. They called my bosses and coworkers and left me many messages, making it clear that my name would inevitably be released to the media. I decided to speak out publicly to a journalist who had originally responded to the tip I had sent to the Washington Post and who had gained my trust. It was important for me to describe the de details of the assault in my own words. Since September 16th, the date of the Washington Post story, I have experienced an outpouring of support from people in every state of this country. Thousands and thousands of people who have had their lives dramatically altered by sexual violence have reached out to share their experience and have thanked me for coming forward. We have received tremendous support from our friends and our community. At the same time, my greatest fears have been realized and the reality has been far worse than what I expected. My family and I have been the target of constant harassment and death threats and I have been called the most vile and hateful names imaginable. These messages, while far fewer than the expressions of support, have been terrifying and have rocked me to my core. People have posted my personal information and that of my parents online on the internet. This has resulted in additional emails, calls, and threats. My family and I were forced to move out of our home. Since September 16th, my family and I have been visiting in various secure locales, at times separated and at times together, with the help of security guards. This past Tuesday evening, my work email was hacked and messages were sent out trying to recant my description of the sexual assault. Apart from the assault itself, these past couple of weeks have been the hardest of my life. I've had to relive this trauma in front of the world. And I've seen my life picked apart by people on television, on Twitter, so other social media, other media, and in this body who have never met me or spoken with me. I have been accused of acting out of partisan political motives. Those who say that do not know me. I am an independent person and I am no one's pawn. My motivation in coming forward was to be helpful and to provide facts about how Mr. Kavanaugh's actions have damaged my life so that you could take into a serious consideration as you make your decision about how to proceed. It is not my responsibility to determine whether Mr. Kavanaugh deserves to sit on the Supreme Court. My responsibility is to tell you the truth. I understand that a professional prosecutor has been hired to ask me questions and I'm committed to doing my very best to answer them. I have never been questioned by a prosecutor and I will do my best. At the same time, because the committee members will be judging my credibility, I do hope to be able to engage directly with each of you. And at this point, I will do my best to answer your questions and would request some caffeine. A Coke or something? That sounds good. Thank that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before yep. I use my five minutes of questioning, um, I thought that I'd, I'd try to remind my colleagues, and in this case, Miss Mitchell as well, that uh, uh, the five minutes, uh, the way I traditionally have done, if you ask a question, uh, before your time runs out, and even though you go over your time, as long as you aren't filibustering, uh, I, I'll let you ask your question. And I'm going to make sure that both uh, Dr. Ford and uh, uh, Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh, uh, as chairman of the committee, I know that they're going to get a chance to answer the questions fully uh, beyond that five minutes. But when that uh, when uh, either Dr. Ford or Judge Kavanaugh uh, gets done, then we immediately go to the next person. So I hope that uh, that, that will be done in a... Uh, and uh, Dr. Dr. Ford, I'm told that you want to break right now, and if you do, that's fine. 
I'm okay. I got the coffee. Thank you very much. I think I can proceed and sip no, on the coffee. Nobody can mix up my coffee right, so I. <laughs> so you're pretty fortunate. <clears throat> uh, so now, uh, with that, uh, uh, Ms. Mitchell, uh, you have my five minutes to ask questions. Good morning, Dr. Ford. Hi. We haven't met. My name is Rachel Mitchell. Nice to meet you. I just wanted to tell you the, the first thing that struck me from your statement this morning was that you were terrified. And I just wanted to let you know I'm very sorry. Um, that's not right. Um, I know this is stressful. And so I would like to set forth some guidelines that maybe will alleviate that a little bit. Um, if I ask you a question that you don't understand, please ask me to clarify it or ask it in a different way. When I ask questions, sometimes I'll refer back to other information you've provided. If I do that and I get it wrong, please correct me. Okay. I'm not going to ask you to guess. I know it was a long time ago. If you do estimate, please let me know that you're estimating, okay? Fair. Okay. Um, we've put before you, and I'm sure you have copies of them anyway, five pieces of information, and I wanted to go over them. Um, the first is a screenshot of a WhatsApp texting between you and somebody at the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. Do you have that in front of you? Yes. Um, the first two texts were sent by you on July 6th, is that correct? Correct. And then the last one sent by you was on July 10th? Correct. Okay. Um, are those three comments accurate? I will read Take them, your yes. Take your time. So there's one correction. Okay. Um, I've misused the word bystander as an adjective. Okay. Bystander means someone that is looking at an assault and, and uh, the person named PJ was not a, technically a bystander. I was writing very quickly with a sense of urgency. So I would not call him a bystander. He was downstairs and you know, what I remember of him was he was a, a tall and very nice person. I didn't know him well, but that he was downstairs, not anywhere near the event. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to take that word out if it's possible. Okay. Thank you for <laughs> clarifying that. Um, the second is the letter that you wrote to Senator Feinstein dated the July 30th of this year. Yes. Uh, did you write the letter yourself? I did. And uh, I, since it's dated July 30th, did you write it on that date? I believe so. I, I, it sounds right. I was in Rehoboth, Delaware at the time. Um, I could look into my calendar and try to figure that out. Um, it, was it written it seemed, on or about that day? Uh, yes, yes. I traveled, I think, the 26th of July to Rehoboth, Delaware. So that makes sense because I wrote it from there. Okay. Is the letter accurate? I'll take a minute to read okay. it. I'll, I'll, I can read fast. Take your time. Okay. Okay, so I have three areas that I'd like to address. Okay. Uh, in the second paragraph, where it says this, the assault occurred in a suburban Maryland area home. Yes. Um, at a gathering that included me and four others. 
I can't guarantee that there weren't a few other people there, but they are not in, um, in my purview of my memory. Would it be fair to say there were at least four others? Yes. Okay. What's the second correction? Oh, okay. The next sentence begins with, Kavanaugh physically pushed me into the bedroom. I would say I can't promise that Mark Judge didn't assist with that. I don't know. It was pushed from behind, so I don't want to put that solely on him. Okay. Okay. Ms. Mitchell, I don't know whether this is fair for me to interrupt, but I want to keep people within five minutes. Is that a, is that a major problem for you in the middle of a question? Because I don't, we've got to, I've got to treat everybody the same. I understand that. Uh, can, can I go to Senator Feinstein or do you? Yes, sir. I, I'm sorry. I didn't see the okay. light was red. Please Senator do. Senator Feinstein. <clears throat> I didn't get the attention. So we're going to come back to that oh, okay. when she comes back. I so see. Just make it I see. Point. Okay. Fast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, when she comes to uh, after Feinstein is done, she'll come back and she'll ask you about the other I, for the benefit of Dr. Ford, I think she'll continue that after the five minutes here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I I'd like to begin by putting some letters in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. If you want to tell me. <clears throat> 140 letters from friends and neighbors of the witness and 1,000 female physicians across the country. Those are what the letters are. Uh, don't look at this. I want to thank you very much for your testimony. I know how very, very hard it is. Um, why, why have you held it to yourself all these years? As you look back, can you indicate what the reasons are? Well, I haven't held it in all these years. I did disclose it in the, in the confines of therapy where I felt like it was an appropriate place to cope with the sequelae of the event. Well, can you tell us what impact the events had on you? Um, well, I think that the sequelae of sexual assault varies by person. So for me personally, uh, anxiety, phobia, and PTSD-like symptoms are the types of things that I've been coping with. So um, more specifically, claustrophobia, panic and that type of thing. Is that the reason for the second door, front door? Correct. Is claustrophobia? Correct. It doesn't, it, our house does not look aesthetically pleasing from the curb. I see. And do you have that second front door? Yes. It's, it, it, and and yes. it now is a place to host Google interns because we live near Google, so we get to uh, have, uh, and other students can live. Can there. you tell us, is there any other way this has affected your life? Um, the primary impact was in the initial four years after the event. Um, I struggled academically. I struggled very much in Chapel Hill and in college. Uh, when I was 17 and went off to college, I had a very hard time, um, more so than others, uh, forming new friendships and uh, especially friendships with, with boys. Uh, and I had academic problems. What were the, con when, when we spoke and it became very clear how deeply you felt about this and the need that you wanted to remain confidential, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so I was watching carefully throughout the summer well, my original intent, I just want to remind, was to communicate with everyone when there was still a list of candidates who all seemed to be, just from my perspective, from what I could read, equally qualified. And I was in a hurry to try to get the information forward, but didn't quite know how to do that. However, once he was selected and it seemed like he was popular and that the, it was an, a sure vote, I was calculating daily the, the risk benefit for me of coming forward and wondering whether I would just be jumping in front of a train that was headed to where it was headed anyway and that I would just be personally annihilated. How did you decide to come forward? 
uh, ultimately because reporters were sitting outside of my home and fr t trying to talk to my dog through the window um, to calm the dog down. And a reporter appeared in my graduate classroom and I mistook her for a student. And she came up to ask me a question and I thought that she was a student and it turned out that she was a reporter. So at that point I felt like enough was enough. People were calling my colleagues at Stanford and leaving messages on their voicemails and on their email saying that they knew my name. Clearly people knew my address because they were out in front of my house. And it just, the mounting pressure it seemed like it was time to just I say want, what I needed to say. I'm sorry. I want to ask you one question about the attack itself. Um, you are very clear about the attack, being pushed into the room. You say you don't know quite by whom, uh, but that it was Brett Kavanaugh that covered your mouth to prevent you from screaming, um, and then you escaped. How are you so sure that it was he? Uh, the same way that I'm sure that I'm talking to you right now. It's uh, just basic memory functions. Um, and uh, also just the level of norepinephrine and epinephrine in the brain that sort of, as you know, encodes that neurotransmitter encodes memories into the hippocampus. And so the trauma-related experience then is kind of locked there, whereas other details kind of drift. So what you are telling us is this could not be a case of mistaken identity. Absolutely not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mitchell for Senator, for Senator uh, Hatch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when we were uh, stopped, you were going to tell us a third uh, correction that you wanted to make on that statement, or I'm sorry, the letter to uh, Senator Feinstein. It's, it wasn't a correction, but I just wanted to comment on it since we were looking at this letter mm -hmm. um, that I did see Mark Judge once at the Potomac Village Safeway after the time of the attack. Mm -hmm. And it would be helpful with anyone's resources if to figure out when he worked there, if people are wanting more details from me about when the attack occurred. If we could find out when he worked there, then I could provide a more detailed timeline as to when the attack occurred. Okay. And that, that is, so that is not a correction in your statement? It's just, no. Okay. Um, you also uh, wrote out a handwritten statement for the polygrapher when you took your polygraph test. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and I, I see corrections on that where you crossed out. So I will go on to the Washington Post article that was okay. originally published on September 16th of this year. And should I just not look at this for accuracy or we're just going to leave that be? We may okay. come back to it if okay. we need to refer to it. Okay. Um, on the Washington Post article, um, did, did you submit to an interview by a reporter with the Washington Post for that article to be written? Correct. Okay. And then finally was the statement that you provided this morning. Uh, I assume that to the best of your recollection that that was accurate. That this whole article is accurate? No, no, no. The statement that you made this morning? Yes. Okay. I want to talk to you about the day that this happened mm -hmm. leading up to the gathering. Okay. In your statement this morning, have you told us everything that you remember about the day leading up to that? Yes. Let me ask just a few questions to make sure that you've thought of everything, okay? Um, you indicated uh, that you were at the country club swimming that day? That's my best estimate of how this could have happened. Okay. Um, and when you say best estimate, is that based on the fact that you said you went there pretty much every day? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. Um, do you recall prior to getting there, so I'm, I'm only talking about up to the gathering, okay. had you had anything to drink? Not at all. Okay. Were you on any sort of medication? None. Okay. 
Okay. Do you recall knowing before you went who was going to be at that gathering? I recall that expecting that Mark Judge and Leland would be at that gathering. Okay. Uh, do you recall an expectation that Brett Kavanaugh would be there? I don't recall that whether he, or not I expected that. Okay. Now, let's talk about the gathering uh, up from the time you arrived till right be when you went up the stairs, just that period of time, okay? Mm -hmm. What was the atmosphere like at the gathering? Um, the, Mr. Kavanaugh and Mr. Judge were extremely inebriated. They had clearly been drinking prior, and the other people at the party were not. Um, the living Can room I was... ask you just to follow up on that? When you said it was clear that they had been drinking prior, do you mean prior to the time you had gotten there or prior to the time they had arrived? Pri prior to the time that they arrived. I don't recall who arrived first, though, whether it was me or them. Okay. Please continue. Okay. So I recall that the I could I can sketch a floor plan. Um, I recall that it was a spar sparsely furnished, fairly modest living room, uh, and it was not really a party, like the news has made it sound. Uh, it was not. It was just a gathering that I assumed was going to lead to a party later on that those boys would attend because they tended to have parties later at night than I was allowed to stay out. So it was kind of a pre-gathering. Was it loud? No, not in the living room. Um, besides the music that you've described that was playing in the bedroom, was there any other um, music or television or anything like that that was adding? No. Okay, so there wasn't a stereo playing downstairs? No. Okay. So, Senator Lee, Dr. Ford, thank you uh, for being here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, the, the way to make this inquiry truly credible is to do what we've always done when new information about a nominee comes to light. <coughs> to use your words this morning, uh, you want to reach the truth. The easy way to do that, ask the FBI to investigate. It's what we've always done. Let them investigate, report back to us. The same applies to the serious allegations made by uh, Deborah Ramirez and uh, Julie Swetnick. Let's have a nonpartisan professional investigation and then take the time to have these witnesses testify. Chairman, you and I were both here 27 years ago. At that time, the Senate failed Anita Hill. I said I believed her, but I'm concerned that we're doing a lot less for these three women today. That's my personal view. Now, Dr. Ford, no matter what happens with this hearing today, no matter what happens with this nomination, I know, and I hear from so many in my own state of Vermont, there are millions of victims and survivors out there who have been inspired by your courage. I am. Bravery is contagious. Indeed, that's the driving force behind the Me Too movement. And you sharing your story is going to have a lasting, positive impact on so many survivors in our country. And we owe you a debt of gratitude for that, Doctor. Now, some senators have suggested you were simply mixed up about who assaulted you. An ally of Judge Kavanaugh in the White House even promoted a wild theory about a Kavanaugh look-alike. You immediately rejected that theory, as did the innocent man who had been called that look-alike. In fact, he sent a letter to this committee forcefully rejecting this absurd theory, and I ask consent to enter that in the record. Without objection. Now, it, <coughs> How did you know Brett Kavanaugh and Mark Judge? And is it possible that you would mix them up with somebody else? No, it is not. And the person that was uh, blamed for the incident is actually the person who introduced me to them originally. So he was a member of Columbia Country Club, and I don't want to talk about him because I think it's unfair, but he is the person that, that introduced me to them. But you, you would not 
mix up somebody else with Brett Kavanaugh. Is that correct? Correct. Or Mark Judge. Correct. Well, then let's go back to the incident. What is the strongest memory you have? The strongest memory of the incident? Something that you cannot forget. Take whatever time you need. Indelible in the hippocampus is the laughter, the, la the uproarious laughter between the two, and they're having fun at my expense. You've never forgotten that laughter. You've never forgotten them laughing at you. They were laughing with each other. And you were the object of the laughter? I was, you know, underneath one of them while the two laughed. Two, fr two friends having a really good time with one another. Let me enter into the record um, a statement by the National Task Force to End Domestic Violence. Without objection, so ordered. And a letter from 24 members of the House of Representatives urging the committee to use the NTF's trauma-informed approach in questioning Dr. Ford. Without objection, And a letter from another 116 members of the House asking to uh, delay it all this has been heard. Without objection, so ordered. And Dr. Ford has at times been criticized for what she doesn't remember from 36 years ago. But we have numerous experts, including a study by the U.S. Army Military Police School Behavior Sciences Education, that lapses of memory are wholly consistent with severe trauma and stress of assault. I'd ask consent that be entered. Without objection, so ordered. And Dr. Ford, I just conclude with this. You do remember what happened, do you not? Very much so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, now, uh, Ms. Mitchell for Senator Graham, and then it's my understanding that, uh, that that's where you'd like to take a break. Does that work for you? Does that work for you as well? well uh, we, we're here to accommodate you, not oh, to thank accommodate you. us. I, I'm used to being collegial. So. Okay, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ms. Mitchell for Senator Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you told uh, Senator Feinstein in your letter that you and four others were present. You've corrected that today to say it was at least four others. When you were interviewed by the Washington Post, you said that there were four boys present at the party. Um, and then in your polygraph statement, you say there were four boys and two girls. When you say two girls, was that you and another or was that two other girls? That was me and one other girl. And that other girl's name? Leland. Uh, Leland Kaiser now? Correct. Okay. Um, so then would it be fair to say at least PJ... Brett Kavanaugh, Mark Judge, Leland Ingram at the time, mm -hmm. and yourself were present, and possibly others. And one one other boy. So there were four. There were four boys. I just don't know the name of the other boy. So. Have you been contacted by anybody saying, "Hey, I was at that party too"? No, I haven't okay. talked with anyone from that party. Okay. Now. You've, you've been detailed about what happened once you got up the stairs, and so I don't need to go through that again. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, you know, oh, I'm sorry. I just realized that I said something that was inaccurate. I said I hadn't spoken with anyone from the party since that. I've spoken with Leland. Okay. okay. Thank you for correcting yeah, that. I appreciate you. that. You've gone into detail about what happened once you went up the stairs, so I don't feel like it's necessary to go over those things again. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Have you told us everything that you do remember about it? I believe so, but if there are other questions, I will. I can attempt to answer them. Okay. Um, you said that the music was solely coming from that room. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And it was turned up once the three of you were inside that room. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, at some point, do you recall it being turned down? 
I don't remember if it was turned down once I was leaving the house. I don't remember. Okay. Likely, since I could hear them walking down the stairs very clearly from the bathroom. Okay. And the bathroom was sure. door was closed when you heard this, is that correct? I could hear them very clearly hitting the walls, okay. going down the stairwell. Um, in fact, in your letter, uh, you said that they went down the stairs and they were talking with other people mm -hmm. in the house. Correct. Uh, were you able to hear that conversation? I was not able to hear that conversation, but I was aware that they were downstairs and that I would have to walk past them to get out of the house. Okay. Now, let me make sure we're on the same page. Were you not able to hear the conversation or not able to understand the conversation? I couldn't hear the conversation. I was upstairs. Okay. How do you know there was a conversation? I'm just assuming since it was a social gathering, people were talking. I don't know. Okay. In I your letter, hear them you... talking as they went down the stairwell. They were laughing and. Okay. In your letter, you wrote both loudly stumbled down the stairwell. At which point, other persons at the house were talking with them. Mm -hmm. Does that ring a bell? Yes, I had to walk past everyone to leave the house. So, okay. I'm not, your letter. I'm not understanding. I'm sorry. Okay. Your um, next sentence. Let me try to clarify this. Uh, after you said other persons at the house were talking with them, the letter goes on with the very next sentence. I exited the bathroom, ran outside of the house, and went home. Correct. Okay. You said that you do not remember how you got home, is that correct? I do not remember. Okay. Other than that, I did not drive home. Okay. I'm going to sh show you if somebody could provide to you a map of uh, the various people's houses at the time, and if you could verify that this is where you were living at the time. Where I was living at the time? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Mr. Chairman, do we have a copy of these documents? We do not have a copy, but I If you want one, we can get you one. Yes, before the questions begin, so we can follow the testimony. Okay. My staff says that we should not provide the copy. No, nope, we will provide the copy. Oh. <laughs> we will provide the copy. Yeah, well, speak plainly with me, please. Oh, sure. I'd no, like not, to see what you. she's My looking staff. at. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. You, you have another 30 seconds now because I was rudely interrupted. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Harris, we do have a, a blown up copy of this for the members to view, if that's helpful. Okay, I'm going to put check marks next to homes that I can confirm are the correct locations and then an X or a question mark when I don't know where these people live. I'm only asking you to confirm if that map accurately shows where you were living at the where time. Where I lived at the time. So um, I can't see the street name, but I'm happy to refer to the address or the neighborhood. Okay, could you tell us that? Yes, it's uh, River Falls. Okay. It's near the, like... Uh, what is the place called? The Naval Research Center on uh, Clara Barton Parkway. Okay. Was that a house or an apartment? It was at my parents' home. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Senator Durbin. Mr. Chairman, I ask consent to enter into the record um, letters of support for Dr. Ford from her classmates at Holton Arms School, 1,200 alumni of the school, 195 of your colleagues, students, and mentors, 1,400 women who, and men who attended D.C. schools, and 50 members of the Yale Law School faculty who are calling for a full FBI investigation. I ask consent to enter these into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Dr. Ford, as difficult as this experience must be, I want you to know that your courage in coming forward has given countless Americans the strength to face their own life-shattering past and to begin to heal their wounds. By example, you have brought many families into an honest, and sometimes painful dialogue that should have occurred a long time ago. I'm sorry for what this has done to you and your family. No one, no one should face harassment, death threats, and disparaging comments by cheap shot politicians simply for telling the truth. But you and your family should know that for every scurrilous charge and every pathetic tweet, there have been thousands of Americans, women and men, who believe you, support you, and thank you for your courage. Watching your experience, it's no wonder that many sexual assault survivors hide their past and spend their lives suffering in pain silence. 
you had absolutely nothing to gain by bringing these facts to the Senate Judiciary Committee. The fact that you are testifying here today, terrified though you may be, the fact that you have called for an FBI investigation of this incident, the fact that you are prepared to name both Judge Kavanaugh and eyewitness Mark Judge stands in sharp contrast to the obstruction we've seen on the other side. The FBI should have investigated your charges as they did in the Anita Hill hearing, but they did not. Mark Judge should be subpoenaed from his Bethany Beach hideaway and required to testify under oath, but he has not. Judge Kavanaugh, if he truly believes there's no evidence, no witnesses that can prove your case, should be joining us in demanding a thorough FBI investigation, but he has not. Today, you come before this committee and before this nation alone. I know you're joined by counsel and family. The prosecutor on the Republican side will continue to ask questions to test your memory and veracity. After spending decades trying to forget that awful night, it's no wonder your recollection is less than perfect. A polished liar can create a seamless story, but a trauma survivor cannot be expected to remember every painful detail. That's what Senator Leahy has mentioned earlier. One question is critical. In Judge Kavanaugh's opening testimony, which we will hear after you leave, this is what he says. I never had any sexual or physical encounter of any kind with Dr. Ford. I am not questioning that Dr. Ford may have been sexually assaulted by some person in some place at some time. Last night, the Republican staff of this committee released to the media a timeline that shows that they've interviewed two people who claim they were the ones who actually assaulted you. I'm asking you to address this new defense of mistaken identity directly. Dr. Ford, with what degree of certainty do you believe Brett Kavanaugh assaulted you? 100%. 100%. In the letter which you sent to Dr. Feinstein, or Senator Feinstein, you wrote, I have not knowingly seen Kavanaugh since the assault. I did see Mark Judge once at the Potomac Village Safeway where he was extremely uncomfortable in seeing me. Would you please describe that encounter at the Safeway with Mark Judge and what led you to believe he was uncomfortable? Yes, I was going to the Potomac Village Safeway. This is the one on the corner of Falls and River Road. And I was with my mother and I was a teenager, so I wanted her to go in one door and me go in the other. So, um, I chose the wrong door because the door I chose was the one where Mark Judge was, uh, looked like he was working there and uh, arranging the shopping carts. And I said hello to him. And his face was white uh, and very uncomfortable saying hello back. Uh, and we had previously been friendly at the times that we saw each other over the previous two years, albeit not very many times, we had always been friendly with one another. Um, I wouldn't characterize him as not friendly. He was just nervous and not really wanting to speak with me. How and he, he looked a little bit ill. How long did this occur after the incident? Uh, I would estimate six to eight weeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we take a break, uh, I can't let what Durbin, Senator Durbin said, by the way, he's my friend, we work on a lot of legislation together, but uh, you talked about the obstruction from the other side. I ca cannot let it go by what you've heard me say so many times, that between July 30th and September 13th, there were 45 days this committee could have been investigating this situation, and uh, her privacy would have been protect, protected. So something happened here in between on your side that the whole country, well, not the whole country should have known about it. No, not know about it. We should have investigated it. We'll take a break now for 15 minutes. As we continue our coverage here in New York City, I'm Bill Hemmer. Uh, the ongoing testimony from 
Dr. Ford, a few riveting moments there describing what, what she experienced personally, talking about the anxiety over time, a phobia, a PTSD, and a panic, and described this um, with um, causing her academic problems that impacted her life for the four years after that. Uh, there were a few clarification moments there by the uh, Rachel Mitchell, who's a career sex crimes prosecutor. And her role, by the way, she was brought on by the Republicans on the committee to go and handle most of the questioning, if not all of it, based on the examples we have seen so far. Uh, it appeared that she was trying to clarify a few points, a few moments from that day uh, 36 years ago. One of the moments of clarification when she stated at least four others were in the house at that time and that she hasn't talked to anyone else who was at the party that night. She clarified it by saying that she had spoken with a, a young woman by the name of Leland. Uh, just toward the end there, Dick Durbin, the Democratic senator from Illinois, asking whether or not you were convinced it was Brett Kavanaugh and the answer from uh, the accuser there, 100 percent. About a 10-minute break right now. I want to bring in Chris Steyerwald, Guy Benson, to help us go through the proceedings today. And, gentlemen, it will be a long day. It is, it is my guess, Chris, that what Chuck Grassley is trying to do is, is to move this forward based on the five-minute timeline that he established at the outset. And that's why you see the interruptions there when Rachel Mitchell is giving the questioning. I guess from a 30,000-foot view, how is this going so far for the accuser? Well, Ford is acquitting herself pretty remarkably, um, given the psychological depth of what she's dealing with. Dealing, what, dealing with what's inside an allegation like this and an experience like this, she is acquitting herself. The Democrats on that committee must be very pleased that she is able to stand and deliver in this fashion. And it's especially difficult because you do have this broken questioning format here, and this is to accommodate the Democrats and this five-minute uh, time limit. So you, as the prosecutor's going through and she's asking the questions and she's getting a little temp going, we have to stop, and we go and we hear from a Democrat who comes in, and then they have to restart. So that makes it all the more challenging. Yeah. And part of her statement, I, I think there were two gripping moments, frankly, Chris. Uh, when she opened up her comments, I believed he was going to rape me. Those are his, her words that she read aloud. It's also in her statement, reading by the word here, I tried to yell for help when I did. Brett put his hand over my mouth to stop me from screaming. That's what terrified me the most and had the most impact on my life. Prior to that, on the page prior, she says, I truly wish I could provide more detailed answers to all the questions that have been asked so far and will be asked. I don't have all the answers and I don't remember as much as I would like to. The reason I bring that up is because we're going to hear Rachel Miller try and jog her memory as best as she possibly can. And these senators are going to have to answer their own question whether or not the, the accuser sitting before them has the veracity um, that, um, they, that they believe enables them to either go forward and confirm Kavanaugh out of this committee or vote no tomorrow. Well, you've got a bunch of audiences here, right? So we have a whole national discussion going on about the Me Too movement, how it proceeds, what constitutes credible th uh, accusations, and how we deal with those things. So there's a huge cultural moment that's taking place right now on America's television screens, and it is gripping beyond gripping. But then, in a practical perspective, there's another audience, and those are the 51 Republican members of the United States Senate, at least a handful of whom have expressed some concern about proceeding with Kavanaugh without more investigation investigation without other things. They've mostly held together to this point, but as they listen to Ford now and then they listen to Kavanaugh's rebuttal later, their votes hang in the balance, this nomination hangs in the balance, and that is an enormous concern in Washington and for these midterm elections and so much more. Yeah. Uh, just so our viewers know, there is a planned committee vote tomorrow for 9.30 a.m. Friday morning. Uh, we expect that schedule to continue uninterrupted unless something comes up today. Guy Benson now joins our coverage, and Guy, good day to you from Washington as well. What are your impressions so far of this hearing? Well, once we started to hear from the witness herself, from her opening statement, and then her responses to the questions thus far, I think she has come across as intelligent, as in control, as certain about what happened to her. I think that if you are suspicious of Brett Kavanaugh or open-minded that he may have done this, her 100 percent certainty, that statement, 100 percent sure it was him and not someone else, was a powerful moment. The other powerful moment, she's a psychologist, I believe, by training, she said that an element of her memory that has never gone away of the entire 
encounter that she describes is the laughter between the two assailants, or the assailant and the other boy who was in the room, who she says was Brett Kavanaugh and Mark Judge, uh, respectively. So there were a few changes to her official recollection of details of the party. Those have to be significant on some level because we have so little real information, corroboration from that time. So the number of people at the party shifting a little bit uh, is of note. I'm not sure if it is totally significant to the average viewer, but I would just say, Bill, overall, if there were Kavanaugh supporters hoping that Dr. Ford would come across as scattered or nervous uh, to the point of not being able to really relate to the questions properly or anything like that or equivocal, that has not been the case thus far. I think that she has seemed to be a credible witness. Where that gets us, I don't know, because of the aforementioned lack of contemporaneous corroboration. Yeah, to both of you, I recall um, the fall of 1991 when Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas were uh, on Capitol Hill, and it was a riveting moment, and there was drama in that monitor and that TV camera that uh, few of us have ever seen prior to that point, and perhaps up until today. Um, and Chris, you talked about the audience. Talk about the audience.